And it, in reality, it just, to me, it was just a name. It was, it was there. And I came to Jesus or God when I was in trouble. I, I seek them only when uh, I was in the streets and had no way out of, of a fight that I, was, I knew I was not gonna win. Uh, it was either a, a die or be alive kind of situation where I'll come to Jesus and be like, get me out of here, or being in jail, being in a camp and saying, don't give me so much time, I'll be the best person I could be. But once I was out and didn't have any, uh, any more responsibility of like trying to talk with, with Jesus, it was like, okay, I'm gonna put you on the shelf and I'll come to you when I need you. So this young high school ministry called the gang, standing for God's anointed now generation. And it just made me fall in love with God at a different pace where it's like, I wanted to go full force. I, I did not want to be the, the sit down Christian. I didn't want to be the lukewarm Christian just sitting there, but I wanted to get involved. And that just changed my whole lifestyle too. Now where I'm at with my wife, with my kids, the way I honor God, honor my wife, uh, honor myself, who I am as a man of God. And that was something that God did, not me or the world, but it was God who said, you know, you, your old self dies. When, when I got uh, baptized and I said, you know, God, I accept into my heart. Soon as I went down that water and came right up, I got a new set of eyes and I saw the world at a different pace, a different way. And um, now I'm, I'm blessed to say that God has blessed me with a beautiful wife, or a woman that loves God, that fears God, and two little boys that are seeing the discipleship, coming here to church and them having this feeling of like, this is where I belong. And um, I'm grateful for that. If you were to ask Victor, how do you go from being in gangs to being on staff of Shoreline Church? You say, the name of Jesus, amen? Yes. Jesus still changes lives. He's doing that all the time. Uh, names are powerful. I, I, I want to show you a picture of a young woman. You may not know her name. You probably don't know her name. But this young woman you see on the screen here is Patricia Ann Van Brat. And Patricia Ann Van Brat, uh, just a... Uh, a wonderful woman. That some, most of you probably don't recognize her, but I'll give you, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about her. Um, there's a number, 5,475. 5,475, that number is how many, average, the average number of diapers that a mother changes for a child from the time they're born till they don't need diapers anymore. And P Patricia, Van, uh, Patricia Ann Van Brought, who changed her name to Patricia Ann Harney when she got married, Changed my diaper about 5,475 times. Uh, and if you say your name, it means something to me. I don't remember my mom when she was a young woman like that. I remember my mom, uh, my mom was at her tallest, five foot tall, bright red hair, tenacious as you can imagine, had a work, work ethic like few people I've ever met in my life. My, my mom could accomplish more in a day than almost anybody I've ever met. And the first Sunday I preached at Shoreline Church almost 10 years ago, that weekend, the first Sunday I preached here, that weekend on Saturday, I was down in Huntington Beach in Southern California doing a funeral for my mom. And I buried my mom on that Saturday, and then I came up here and I preached my first Sunday at Shoreline Church almost 10 years ago. My mom's name, Pat, Patricia, Patricia Ann Harney, it means something because her name for me captures all that she was. And if somebody misused her name, if somebody spoke bad of her and used her name poorly, man, that would hurt me because I love her. Her, her name reminds me of who she was. And today we are in the third commandment in the Ten Commandments and we're talking about this idea of God's name. You might have noticed the theme through all the songs that we sang. In the name of God. And so in the third commandment, it's just one verse and we'll read it on the screen later in our Bibles, but I want you just to hear it First, in Exodus 27, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. 
There's this call in the third commandment to be careful how we use God's name. It really is calling us to lift up his name, to glorify his name, to, to honor his name like we've been doing in worship today. It's a two-sided coin. It's honor and glorify the name of God, but be careful we don't misuse and abuse the name of God. Each of the Ten Commandments, and we're spending the whole summer on these Ten Commandments, and we we can take down that picture of my mom now, that's great. Uh, Each each of the Ten Commandments uh, really uh, paints a a picture for us of what freedom looks like, of what living the right kind of life looks like. And and, and some people wonder, why, why did God give so many laws? Why didn't God just say, listen, you know, I trust you, you know, figure it out, live a good life. Um, you know, here, here's the question. Do we really need God's direction and laws to stay in the right path? Do we need God to tell us how to live? I mean, can't we just as human beings, can't we just make wise choices? Why does God have to kind of interfere in our lives and tell us what to do and what not to do? I think a lot of people think that way today. That there's this thinking that, that it has been prevalent throughout history, but I think really a lot right now, and that is the idea that if we just let leave people to their own devices, We'll move towards being good, kind, compassionate people. The world will become a peaceful place. I mean, isn't that what, isn't that what happens when you just leave people to their own devices and you remove God from this, this scenario and just let people be themselves? The world is just a beautiful, peaceful, loving place. Isn't that right? Well, you know, not, not if you know anything about history. The 20th century, the 20th century on this planet, probably the most violent century in the history of the world, we, we, you know, but don't we move towards order? Don't we move towards love and kindness and compassion? We're, we're more civilized. We're more enlightened than ever. But do, do you know, if you know your history, you know that in the 20th century, under Stalin, Hitler, and Mao, just those three global leaders, somewhere between 110 million and 162 million people were wiped off the face of this earth under those three leaders. The, when, when your variation is in the tens of millions, you know it's a mess. But, but, but no, people left to our own devices. I mean, get God out of the picture and everything goes smoothly. Just we'll, we'll make all the right decisions. Well, there's nothing in history that seems to support that. We need God's guidance. We need his direction. And the Ten Commandments, it's, it's, it's ten specific words from God to show us here's the pathway to walk on. Here's how to live life. And if we were to walk in these, if no one murdered, if no one stole, if, if no one bore false witness against other people, it would transform our world. And people, people get, you know, well, God, I don't want God telling me what to do. It makes me feel kind of confined. But, but here's, here's a question. Why follow the Ten Commandments? If you're a follower of Jesus, because I'm a Christian, I can just be nice and loving like Jesus. Do I need the Ten Commandments to kind of guide and direct me and to give me, give me sort of a, a path to walk? And the answer is yes, we do. Why follow the Ten Commandments? Here's one reason, if you're a Christian. We are God's holy priests and ambassadors. Do you know that when you become a Christian, you become part of a royal priesthood, God's own people. And you, and you, you, you share his love and light with the world. When I was 15 and became a Christian, God said, you're a holy priest. Didn't feel like one, didn't look like one. Sometimes I didn't act like one, but that's who God was making me. We bear his message and his love to the world. Why follow the Ten Commandments? Because our God is a loving father. We have a loving father who says, I love you so much, I'm going to give you direction for your life. And and I've learned this even growing up as a little kid. I didn't always appreciate the boundaries my dad gave, but I look back now, and for the most part, they were very wise. And our heavenly father is always wise and always good. Why follow his commandments? Because he wants the best for us, and he's our loving heavenly father. Why follow the Ten Commandments? Because they are the pathway to freedom, hope, and beauty. If everyone walked in the ways that God has set before us, our world would have a sense of freedom and hope and beauty and glory like we can't comprehend. The problems come when we push back against what God wants for us. God made us, he loves us, and he wants the best for us. Why follow the Ten Commandments? His law set the foundation for civility, lawfulness, and a good society. I believe this. Anywhere in the world, any people who would yield to Jesus Christ and surrender to his word and follow God's guidelines, it will transform a home, a neighborhood, a sports team, a social gathering, a community, the world. And that's what God is in the business of doing because he loves the children that he's created. And, and some people get bothered about following God's laws. There's people like, I just want to do things my way, and they really push back. And you know, why, do you have to have, why, you know, why do we have to have 10 commandments? 
We gotta spend 10 weeks talking about the 10. You know, can't we just, you know, can't we just like pick the six you like best? You know, pick six of them, work with those. And you know, is it, can it be sort of multiple choice, choose the commandments you like? No, every one of them is life-giving. Every one of them is from the heart of God. And if you feel like God's overdoing it with these 10 commandments, I'll give you some perspective, all right? If you say, why do we need so many laws? Now, watch this. In 2010, how many new laws, this is a little trivia, answer in your own mind. In 2010, how many new laws were added to local, state, and federal level uh, governments in the United States? In that year, 2010, come up with a number in your mind. How many new, this is not all the laws, new laws. Here's the answer. Over 40,000. We're just talking about 10. All right, comparatively, you know, what if, if I could memorize and know the Ten Commandments and live those? More than 40,000 laws in one year. Now, here's another thing. How, why do we need so many laws? In 2008, a U.S. House committee was asked to study and determine how many criminal offenses exist in the United States federal criminal law. How many offenses are there? After five years, they studied this for five years. How many offenses are there? After five years, I'm going to read the entire report to you. Here was their report. You ready? We lack the manpower and resources to answer such a question. Everybody look up here. Here's their answer. Here's their answer. We don't know. We can't even figure out. And, and here we have, this summer, we're saying, here's 10 words from God. And, and, and a lot of the civil law comes out of actually God's commandments. Do not murder. And then there's all kinds of ways of breaking that down. But, but what is God saying to us? Why is he saying to us? Why, why is this important? The 10 commandments are really light lifting compared to what, you know, what's out there in culture. But if we understand these and follow them with all of our heart, it transforms our lives. So I want to read Exodus 27 again. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. If you have your Bibles or your, your, your tablets, you can open up to your Bible, your Bible app, Bible app there to Exodus 20. And here's the whole commandment, number third commandment. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Don't misuse God's name. It's, it's, it's a two-sided coin. Honor God's name. Don't misuse his name. The name that here, and when you see, the, the, when you see Lord in your Bible, L-O-R-D, all capitalized, that's actually this name. You'll see it up on the screen here. That's Yahweh. Is our screen working? I know we were, they were, it was misbehaving before. It's not working. There would be a really beautiful Hebrew script of the four characters of the name of Yahweh if the screen was working. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, so so th this, this Hebrew name, Yahweh, we translate L-O-R-D, all capitals. And the name Yahweh comes from the root word to, to be, it, it, the, the God who is, the God who always is, the eternal God. You know, the, the Yahweh is this, this eternal God. And the ancient people wouldn't even punctuate the name because they were so afraid of somebody saying it and misusing it in some way. We've kind of gone the other direction in our culture. We don't really think about God's name or how we use God's name. We don't think about the meaning and the power of names anymore. But in the ancient world, the name meant so much. And you think, well, what's, you know, what's in a name? When we name kids, we you know, we'll go online and look up names and find names that have meaning or get your know, family history. When, when you hear kind of an interesting name, so is there a family history behind that name? Imagine talking to somebody and, they, and they've got a little boy, first child, and they tell you the name. You say, well, what's, what's the background of that name? That's an interesting name. Is there a family history there? So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy says, my uncle... My uncle was a drunk. I mean, he drank all the time. He just drunk himself to death. He left his family destitute. He, never, he, was, he was harsh, mean-spirited. Nobody liked him. We named our, our son after him. Right? Who does that? What's the answer? Nobody. Nobody. Because names matter. You, know, you, you name after a family member who you remember or to honor a person or, or a name. I, I have a nephew whose name is Leith Adnan Maswada. And Leith's name means lion-hearted in Arabic. You know, so, so, I, so, so that, you know, name, names have meaning to them. They have stories behind them, and we have to understand that. And every name sort of brings, when you, if you say Patricia Ann Harney, all these images come to my mind. But I could give you names, and you'll probably have pictures in your mind. So look at the screens. How about this name? What comes, and don't say anything out loud, just what comes to your mind. Okay? All kinds of pictures, right? Incredible athlete, right? Made some bad choices along the way. Incredible comeback. Probably maybe the most incredible comeback in sporting history. But you know, if you, you know, people can picture a person and some of their story and their and, and character and all these things come down. Here's, here's another name. How about this name? Mother Teresa. Some of you that are younger may not even know that name. Google it after the service and, and learn about her. You think of Calcutta, orphans. 
a great godly woman who cared for the poor in ways that were just staggering and beautiful. How about a president? Okay, Abraham Lincoln. You know, your pictures, most of a picture in their mind and, and, and character. And, you know, every name, every name has a story behind it. And when you, the more you know the person, the more that name brings it alive. A name tells a story. A name declares the character of a person. A name captures the person in the ancient world, especially names meant so much. And the name of God, Yahweh, and all the names. You know, God has many, many, many names when you read through the Bible. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the first and the last. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the great provider. He is Yahweh. His name is Jesus. He has many names. And every name upholds who this one God is. A character tells a story, declares, a name tells a story, declares the character, and captures the person. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Psalm chapter 8. And I want to read some passages that talk about the name of God. Because we have to understand that God's name matters. Just like people's names matter, but far more so, God's name contains his character and his will and his glory. So in Psalm chapter 8, verse 1, in Psalm 8, 1, we read these words. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. His name is majestic and glorious. Look at Psalm 29, verses 1 and 2. In Psalm 29, verses 1 and 2, we read this. And this name Yahweh, this, this capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, that's how it's translated in English, is four times in these two verses. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory, do his name. He deserves glory. His name cries out for it. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And then when Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, we read this in Matthew 6, 9. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed, holy, glorious, exalted is the name of the Lord our God. And so God, with his glorious name, says to us, do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. This is the one who is the Lord who saves. This is the one who is the Lord who provides for us. This is the Lord who created us. This is the Lord who loves us. This is our Lord. And so don't misuse his name. So here's the question. What does it mean to misuse the name of the Lord? What does that mean? Don't misuse the name of the Lord. Well, there's at least seven meanings behind this. And I want to, I'm sorry, at least six meanings behind. There's probably more, but at least six that are very clear. And I want to walk through these six and ask all of you to really listen and say, Lord, is there a way I'm misusing and pushing down your name? Is there any way I can exalt and lift up your name, lift up who you are because your name reflects your character? Am I doing things that push down the character in the name of God? Or am I living in a way or speaking in a way? Or am I lifting him up? If you're a note taker, you can write these down. There's a place in your bulletin to write a few notes. But for all of you, I encourage you to listen and let God speak to your heart. I believe that every single person here, family worship venue, online, every single person, if we pay attention, we'll say, hey, there's some way. I might be intentionally or accidentally pushing down the name of God and misusing it. And there's some way I can lift up his name with greater passion and greater seriousness. So what does it mean to misuse the name of the Lord? Here's one way we can do that. Using God's name in a foolish, vain, or empty way. Using God's name like it means nothing, like it's a kind of a rag we can throw away. Just using God's name like, it's just throwing it out there. When I was growing up, my dad would often misuse, my dad would misuse God's name. I never heard the name of Jesus or the name of God in my home growing up except when my dad was angry. And it was always profanity. It was always, always a curse, using God's name as a curse. You know, imagine if people started saying this when they're really mad, really ticked off, really, and, they say, and they, they just want to swear, so they just say, ah, oh, Patricia Ann Harney. It's my mom's name. Why would you drag my mom's name into your anger? But we do it with God's name all the time. And, and let me be clear. I'm not talking about you going to other people and telling them how they should use or not use their words. Let God speak to your heart. You know, when I first became a Christian, I had heard that use of God's name so much, it took me time to get that out of my vocabulary. This name that this name that becomes more and more beautiful with every passing day to me. 
this beautiful name of Jesus, this name of Yahweh, the Lord, the one who made me and loves me and, and, and called me his own and cleansed me, that God, his name, becomes more and more precious and I'm more and more careful to lift it up and not throw it in the mud and misuse it. Let God speak to your heart. And there are moments where all of a sudden you get frustrated or angry and God's name comes out of your mouth, but it's not a praise. It's not, it's not honoring his name. It's misusing his name lightly. Or, or even in jokes that we tell where God comes into the joke or Jesus comes in, are we misusing, are you using his name lightly? Now let me be clear. I love humor. I love jokes. I love laughing. I think laughing is a gift from God. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when we drag God's name into those things. To ask yourself the next time you start to say a joke, you go, boy, if I'm, am I, there's nothing wrong with stopping and saying, is this appropriate use of God's name? And if you think it's not, don't do it. Go find another joke that you can tell that's funny but doesn't drag God's name in. You know, just, are, are we, are we you know, using God's name in foolish, vain, or empty ways? Be careful. And then, and then just say, Lord, I want to lift up your name, not misuse it. Here's the second thing. What does it mean to misuse the name of the Lord? Using God's name for my own purposes and agenda. When I, when I use God's name manipulatively to propel myself forward or to lift myself up. He said, what, what do you mean? How, how can we misuse God's name for our own purpose and our own agendas? Well, how about this? When you're telling somebody something and you're trying to convince them that you're telling the truth. And you say, no, no, this is really true. And they don't trust you. No, no, it's really true. And they don't believe you. First of all, ask yourself, why don't they believe me? There's probably a deeper issue at hand, Right? And then you, then you say, no, no, it's really true. I'm, I'm telling you, it's true. And they don't believe you. And then you finally drop the nuclear bomb. You go, oh, it's true. I swear to. And we throw God's name into it. When, the moment you do that, why do you have to bring God into that conversation? Why do you have to swear to and drop God's name into that? Because they don't believe you. They don't trust you. Don't use God's name to manipulate the situation and force them to trust you. How about be a more trustworthy person? So they actually believe you and trust you. Ask yourself, why do I have to get to the point where I'm always having to swear that way? I think that's a misuse of God's name. We're using it to prove that we're telling the truth, and sometimes we're not. And when we know we're not speaking the truth, and then we say, I swear to, and throw God into it, that's a misuse of the name of God for our own purposes, our own agenda. Can I suggest something else that may cause some of you to think and reflect? If on your website... If, 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 you, you know, if you're putting like a little fish or a Bible verse or, or something that says, I'm a Christian, be careful that you're doing that because you want to lift up the name of Jesus, not because you want to try to say, hey, you can trust me. I'm a good business person because I got a little fish on my card or I got a little fish on my website. Nothing wrong, with, nothing wrong with a great Bible passage there. Nothing wrong with saying you're a Christian, but you better make sure you do business like a Christian if you're, if you're saying, hey, by the way, I'm a Christian, so are, are you using God at that point to manipulate and get people to trust you? And you know, it used to be in business, if you went to a local church, you were more trusted. Now I don't even know if that's even true. You know, it's changing, right? But, but are we utilizing God's name to propel ourselves forward for our own purposes, our own agendas? And if we're doing that, we better ask ourselves, am I really living that out or am I just doing it to try to somehow propel myself forward? That's not what God's name is about, being glorified, not about us trying to prove that we're trustworthy. Here's a third response to this question. What does it mean to misuse the name of the Lord? Using God's name for spiritual manipulation. Specifically, not business manipulation, but spiritual manipulation. When people say things like this, you know, the Lord told me you should do this or that. Oh, be careful. Be careful. First of all, you better know the Lord told you. In the Old Testament, when people said, thus saith the Lord, and it wasn't true, they got in big trouble. I won't go to the details, but it was bad consequences. Yeah, yeah. The, the Lord told me, I got a, I've got a friend who's very well off. I asked him one time, he says, anybody ever come to you and told you that God told them that you're supposed to give them money? He says, all the time. He says, I get to him, he says, I get to him, and people come to me and said, the Lord told me you're supposed to give me a million dollars. This is true. It's like, you'll know, give a million towards my ministry. Give a ministry, you know, God, God told me. I said, how do you respond to that? You know what he said? Well, I just tell him, I'll talk to the Lord. <laughs> and if he tells me to do it, I'll do it. But I'm not going to do it because you think the Lord told you. He needs to talk to me about this. And this is actually a person who's very generous and been very generous to me. But he, he waits till the Lord tells him. God told me you should. Now, if the Holy Spirit prompts you, 
with somebody who you love and trust to speak a word of truth. I'm not, I'm not saying that's wrong to do, but I'm saying be careful. Because there's some church traditions where the Lord's always telling everybody something about somebody else and, and that maybe the Lord's not telling that person that thing. And so let's be careful that we're not dragging the Lord into it. Maybe I, I had somebody come to me once and say to me, the Lord told me you and Sherry should adopt two little girls. Now, this couple happened to have adopted two little girls, and they were really big into adoption, very passionate about it. And I think that they transposed, because we talk you know, to the Lord a lot, we pray a lot. We've never felt led to, although we got three daughter-in-laws now, so it worked out pretty good. But that, they were talking about adopting you know, poor children from a certain country. But they came to me and said, the Lord wants you to. And they were upset with us when we didn't. Be careful when you decide what God is saying for someone else. You better make sure it's the Lord and not your own inclinations, your own feelings, your own passions. I think we misuse the Lord's name when we start to tell people the Lord said when the Lord didn't say. Here's a fourth way we can understand this. What does it mean to misuse the name of the Lord? Making a promise or taking an oath in God's name and not meaning it or not keeping it. It's changing in our culture now, but it used to be in a court situation when somebody was gonna be you know, put on as a witness, they would have, you know, put their hand on a Bible and they'd say they're gonna tell the truth, the whole truth and not, nothing but the truth. You remember the next part? So help me God right? They were swearing on a Bible in the name of God to speak the truth. So now you have two different people who are Christians from maybe different churches in the same town swearing on the same Bible, the truth, the whole truth, but nothing but the truth, so help me God, and they tell their stories and they're exactly the opposite. You go, some, somebody, somebody in that moment, there's a word for it, somebody is, what's the word I'm looking for? Somebody is yeah, lying, wrong, confused. Something, something's wrong there, right? Be careful when, when you say, I'm gonna swear in the name of God, so help me God. You, you, you better speak the truth. And if you're a Christian and you have to go be in court and they ask you to give an oath that you're gonna speak the truth and you plan on lying, you tell them I can't make the oath, I don't plan on telling the truth. <laughs> you say, well, that's not gonna help my case. No, but it'll help your faith, all right? Don't swear falsely in the name of God. His name is too holy, too beautiful, too pure. And God will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. This is a big deal. Number five, what does it mean to misuse the name of the Lord? Bearing the name of Jesus lightly. When you bear the name of Jesus, when you become a Christian, you bear his name. What do you mean I bear his name? If you say, I'm a Christian, whose name is in that word Christian? Christ, the Messiah. When the Christians were first called Christians, it actually meant they're, they're little Christ. They're people that are trying to be like little Jesuses. And, they, and it was almost meant to be sort of a slam. But the Christians went, oh, we like that. Yeah, we're, we're trying to be like Jesus. We're trying to follow Jesus. We are Christians. So you bear, you bear the name Christian. What if you bear the name Christian and you don't live like a Christian? Does that affect the name of God and how people see his name? Yes, that misuses his name. I'm a Christian. I don't act like a Christian. That's a misuse of God's name. So you put on a beautiful cross. I think it's wonderful to wear a cross as a witness. And then you go around all day long with your beauty. You, know, you wear a cross out so everyone can see it. And you gossip all day long. You backbite about people. You gossip about people. You're, you're just juicy morsels and you're telling everyone you can tell and you're sporting your little cross there. Is that a misuse of the name of God? I think it is. We bear the name of Christ. We bear the name Christian and we don't live it out. Or you put on your Jesus Witness t-shirt. You know, you put on your, 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 your God's Gym t-shirt or your Jesus Witness. So kinds of, you know, and I'm not against Jesus Witness t-shirts, but you, know, you put it on and then you go to the sideline of your kid's sporting event. And you're that parent who's screaming at the ref, who everyone's wrong, who acts like a four-year-old and there's 12 year olds on the field, you know. And, they're, ah! and you're wearing your Jesus Witness t-shirt. Well, you know what? You're being a witness to Jesus. You absolutely are. It's just not a good one, Right? And it's not just the appeal to the shirt off and don't wear it. Because people know if you're a Christian, they know you're a Christian. As you say, God, let my life align. Let my life align with your will and your ways. When I bear your name, let me lift up and glorify your name. Let, let people say, you know, I don't know, always agree with him or her, but boy, they're honest. Boy, they're truthful. Boy, they're kind. And lift up the name. We can lift up the name of Jesus by living like him and for him. Or we can bring down the name of Jesus by bearing his name and not living it out. How about this one? How about bumper stickers? Here's some, here's some, is, that, is, that, is that working either? That's not, never mind. Well, I have some beautiful bumper stickers to put across there and show you. But the one in the, the, one in the middle, it said pastor with two big crosses. Boy, if you're a pastor and you drive like a maniac, <laughs> don't put bumper stickers on your, on your you know, car about pastor and about, about Jesus. 
If you're a Christian, you got Christian bumper stickers. Make sure you're not the one that's, uh, that's uh, cutting people off and then giving them a little sermon as you go by, as you talk to them, and you're a little, you know, just... Uh, do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. When you bear the name of Jesus, when you carry the name of Jesus, it means something. Who you are and how you live reflects for other people. Sherry and I have a family that we've been friends with. Well, Sherry's been friends with the Borsmans for 30 plus years, 40 40 years, probably 40 years. I've known him for about 30 years. And Paul Borson has become a good friend of mine. He's a pastor. He's a chaplain at a Christian college. And there's times where he would bring his kids when our kids were growing up in, in Michigan, that kids would come over sometimes and hang out at our house and sometimes stay the night or stay for an evening. And this dad, Paul, would look at his son, and I think Aaron was the one who came over most often, but he would look at his son before he left, stand on the front porch before he left and said, son, remember who you are. Remember who you are. That was the last thing he'd say to his kid every time he'd leave him somewhere. Remember who you are. I think he was saying two things. I think he was saying, son, you're a borsma. You're part of our family. And you reflect our family. But more than that, what he was saying is, son, you're a child of the living God. Remember who you are. You reflect Jesus in every situation you walk into. But it'd be good for all of us in every situation we walk into just to pause and say, Help me remember who I am. I'm a son. I'm a daughter of the living God. I'm a child of God. And I reflect my father. And I can bring honor to his name or I can drag his name through the mud. And we're all on a journey of becoming more like Jesus. This isn't about perfection and it isn't beat myself up. It's saying, how do I move forward living in a way that lifts up the name of Jesus? And then sixth and finally, what does it mean to misuse the name of the Lord? I think worshiping in a half-hearted manner. I think, I think putting on the appearance of, of living for Jesus, but being half-hearted, being faint-hearted, I think, I think is a misuse of God's name. And, and I really believe that worship is a journey of, of growth on our own, corporately with God's people. But when we, when we bear the name, when we say, I'm, I'm gathered in the name, when we gather as a church, we gather in the name of Jesus. We gather in his presence and among his people. And I want to challenge you to, to, to look and say, are, are you somebody who is, is passionate about glorifying God? I, you know, whether, whether we're singing, whether we're praying, whether we're in, you know, learning from God's word and reading the scriptures together, am I glorifying God? Am I lifting up God? Because when we gather like this, we are saying, I am among God's people. I am a child, of the, I'm a daughter of the living God. I'm a son of the living God. Then lift him up like you love him, like you worship him and celebrate him. Glorify him and lift him up. Take the name of God seriously. Because you bear it if you're a Christian. You bear his name. And if you're not yet a Christian and you become a Christian, you will bear the name of Jesus till you see him face to face. So live in a way that lifts up his name. In Acts chapter four, verse 12, we read these words. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There is one name, the name of Jesus, who is the Lord who is our Savior. Philippians 2, 10 to 11 says this, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue can acknowledge or confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. At the name of Jesus, at his name. The third commandment, do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Rather, lift him up, glorify him. So wherever you go, whatever you do, if you've come to the cross and received Jesus, remember who you are. Remember whose you are. And remember that the world is learning about our God every time they look at us. Bear his name with joy and passion and honor. Lord Jesus, we pray that you will teach us the glory of your name. Lord, no matter how much we know your name and love your name and honor, honor your name, Lord, there's more than we understand. There's more goodness and glory and power in who you are. So Lord, let us bear your name. Let us, let us not misuse your name. Let us not drag it through the mud. Let us, not, let us not treat your name lightly. But Lord, let us lift up your name and glorify your name. And let our lives show the world who you are. Because Jesus, day by day, you're transforming us. That every knee would bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord 
to the glory of God the Father. This is our prayer. And Jesus, we pray it in your name. Amen.